Indians swing into action at Tucson, Arizona. Baseball's World Series champions get set for another pennant push under popular manager Lou Boudreau. Pitchers start loosening arms while losing fat. Longtime ace Bob Feller is a standout in the throwing department, along with serious sensation Gene Bearden. Cleveland has power in outfielders Dale Mitchell and Larry Doby, and an infield combo that's strictly top drawer. And now for camera and practice, Boudreaux demonstrates his famous pickoff play. A thumbs up signal, and the man is out. While the team polishes its diamond glitter, another Indian gets ready for service. He's Bob Hope, a distinguished pale face, who's both an official and booster of the Cleveland club, and quite a star in the entertainment league. Right. Right now, Bob's making sure of batting a thousand. Yes, with pitching, playing, batting, and hope, Cleveland's champions heed baseball's call of spring. Headquarters of the Soviet Repatriation Mission in Frankfurt. Here for nearly two days, the eight members of the mission were cut off from all subsistence by the U.S. Army for refusing to leave the American zone of Germany. General Clay had ordered the repatriation unit to leave on the ground that its work was finished and that any Russians still in Western Germany wanted to stay there. Finally, in the dead of night, the mission makes a dramatic exit, but not before official permission had come from Marshal Sokolovsky's command in Berlin, a move interpreted as another blow to Russian prestige in Germany. Destination is the Soviet zone entrance at Halmstedt, 340 miles from Frankfurt. The Russian motorcade runs into all kinds of engine and tire trouble en route. The four stops make possible some hurried camera studies of the Russians, who are not too anxious to pose. Some four hours late, the motorcade reaches the American-Russian zonal border. In retaliation for this ouster, the angry Russian command orders the U.S. Graves Registration Commission to leave the Soviet zone at once. President Truman receives the outgoing and incoming secretaries of defense in his office. New man is Lewis Johnson, a West Virginia lawyer who is slated to succeed James Forrestal on March 31st as civilian boss over all the armed services. At Washington National Airport, there's a big hand for another Truman, Miss Margaret. The president's daughter is here to christen a giant Stratocruiser, the America, the world's largest commercial airplane. I christen thee, Tipper America. God bless you. Her christening chores completed, Margaret, accompanied by her mother, goes aboard the big plane built to carry 75 passengers. Another entry in the busy Truman family diary, as Margaret is the prettiest pilot the plane has ever had. Next morning, it's the president who again faces the cameras. After a briefing from the first lady, he's off to the Key West submarine base for a 13-day vacation in Florida. Beating the press to the landing, Mr. Truman promptly turns the tables and prepares to interview White House reporters. For once, the chief executive is Quizmaster. Just a bit of presidential whimsy before settling down to the serious business of mixing a little sunshine into a presidential schedule. At Lake Success, the UN Security Council debates the admission of Israel to UN membership. Israeli Representative Aubrey Eben watches the drama in which Egyptian delegate Fawzi Bey argues against admission. U.S. Delegate Austin listens as Britain's Delegate Schoen is asked, in effect, to veto the Israeli bid. But after discussion, the council votes in favor of the young Jewish state. Nine nations vote aye, Britain abstains. With only Egypt voting nay, Israel may now become the 59th member of the United Nations family, subject to the approval of the General Assembly. Meanwhile, on the island of Rhodes, a UN plane brings delegates from Israel to another debate. Peace talks with Transjordan, now going on under UN mediation. Flying in from their capital, Amman, the Transjordanians arrive. 
the negotiations that are being conducted here under UN auspices and the personal supervision of America's Dr. Ralph Bunch have been slowed down by numerous difficulties. But what is at stake is well worth the trouble, for agreements reached here will mean certain peace in Palestine. At Chicago Stadium, the top-notch Minneapolis Lakers play the Harlem Globetrotters in an exhibition game. And what an exhibition it turns out to be. The Globetrotters in striped trunks feature trigger quick ball handling and play a kind of game that might be called basketball bebop. Bebop, bebop. Late in the game, the Trotters edge ahead of the Lakers and try holding the ball in a freeze. A familiar maneuver in many a basketball game, the freeze in general practice is a cautious, desperate effort to keep possession of the ball. But just watch the comic carefree Trotters do it. dizziest breeze is effective. A real comedy of the court as the Trotters put on an amazing show to beat the Lakers 49 to 45. 